Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 32, Text 20, Translation and Commentary by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. Materialistic persons are allowed to go to the planet called Pitriloga by the southern course of the sun, but they again come back to this planet and take birth in their own families, beginning again the same fruitive activities from birth to the end of life. Purport. In Bhagavad Gita, 9th chapter, verse 21, it is stated that such persons are elevated to the higher planetary systems. As soon as their lifetimes of fruitive activity are finished, they return to this planet, and thus they go up and come down. Those who are elevated to the higher planets again come back into the same family for which they had too much attachment. They are born, and the fruitive activities continue again until the end of life. There are different prescribed rituals from birth until the end of life, and they are very much attached to such activities. Timirandhasya Yanam Jana Shalakaya Chakshuru Mili Tamlena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vande Guru Nisha Bhaktams Isha Nisha Bhattarakam Tat Prakasham Satat Chakti Krishna Chaitanya Sangitam Tayatam Suratopankar Mamamanda Matergati Matsaravasvapadam bhojo radha madana mohana Nilachana nivasaya nittaya paramahana balabhadra subhadra bhyam jaganataya te namaha Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare Although there's no such word as Hindu in Shastra, the description that is being given in this series of verses is or would be fitting for persons we could call pious Hindus. Actually, more pious than any Hindus we'll find today because no one can, at least in the performance of their activities, no one nowadays can perform the ritualistic activities in the proper way. The whole way of life militates against even being able to perform the activities. People don't have time, even if they have the inclination, they don't have time to perform so many ritual activities. It's, it's not that the rituals are done just on some days. Well, some rituals are done on some days. Naimitic Kriya. But there's also Nitya Kriya, which is done on a daily basis. And it takes a lot of time. Traditionally, the Brahmanas, they don't they get up early in the morning and they don't eat anything until midday. They're busy, they have so many things to do. Taking bath, that in itself is... Uh, there's so many rituals to perform a lot. It has to be done in a specific way with so many different mantras. And then performing yagya, they have to... Before they can eat, they have to feed so many guests, they have to feed cows. And, so many things they have to do. So it's not that the Brahmin's life was a lazy life. They were busy, but in a different way to the way people are busy nowadays, which they're so busy they don't have time for all these things. So people don't have time nowadays to do all these things. They don't have the inclination. And even if they wanted to, it's very difficult to find the proper situation to do all these things because, for instance, one requires pure water, 
and very difficult to get. We are using, or everyone is using, for puja, water that, according to Shastric standards, is not acceptable. Water has to be collected from a pure source. So those who are living close to a, to a holy river, they can get pure water. Or those that have an uncontaminated well in their compound, which isn't in an apartment building shared with different people, with the water also used for flushing stool. So they can get water that is ritualistically pure, otherwise very difficult. And then uh, one has to keep oneself pure by keeping pure association. That's why the, the brahmanas, they didn't mix with all different kinds of people. There are many of them who, they only knew the agrahara and the temple. And that was all. The Agrahara means the... I know all the Indian devotees, I presume, the, at least the South Indian, Indian devotees know. But that means the compound for the residents of the Brahmanas around the temple. So they would go home and they spend most of the time in the temple and come home for resting and eating, and maybe they'd also do part, and there'd be some separate puja at home also. So they didn't know anything, so they didn't go out anywhere. One devotee was telling me in the deep south of Tamil Nadu, there's one temple where the, the, they don't use salt in offering to the Lord, because the, the Stala Purana, says that Krishna or Narayan, of course, they, he was coming there and Lakshmi was cooking for him. She was so excited that she was cooking for him that she forgot to use salt and she cooked everything without salt. So then they were asking, how was it? He said, everything is very nice. So from that time, they never cooked <laughs> with salt. And apparently everything tastes ati madhuram, or very nice, we could say in simple English, very nice. But the, the devotees tell me the brahmanas there, they don't know what salt is. They've never seen it, they've never tasted it, because they don't go out. They only remain within the compound. Prabhupada also told, either Pankajangri or Janani Vas Prabhu in Mayapur, that you don't go outside the compound, you just stay at Iskon Mayapur, the Pujari. That's traditional Pujari doesn't go anywhere. Just is with the Lord, serves the Lord, lives with the Lord, and passes away like that at his lotus feet. One Pujari in Dwaraka recently was telling me that we wake up with the Lord, we spend all day with the Lord, and at night when He takes rest, then we also go into rest. <laughs> like this, is their life. Of course, what's being described here about the pious materialistic persons, not necessarily just Brahmanas, but in recent years, the adherence to rituals, if anyone has been doing in Hindu society, it's mostly the Brahmins, by which we mean, but in this context we mean Brahmana by caste. They're mostly more interested in upkeeping all these things. And still, in India, those who are upholding the traditional rituals are mostly the uh, to whatever extent they can, it's, we could say, largely from Brahmana caste. Although, unfortunately, there are so many instances of children of Brahmana families who don't know all these things. They have no idea. So it is being described here, piety performing pious activities. They're not activities of bhakti. Their activities, what for? For, mm, 
evam tvai dharma manu prapana gata gatam kama kama labhante performing pious activities with the result of following the Vedic karma kanda with the result of going to the heavenly planets and coming back again coming and going, coming and going and herein it's stated that they may come back in the same family this chapter is entitled Entanglement in Fruitive Activities so even this piety it's certainly better to be pious than impious, but that is also the cause of entanglement. That you see that these pious people, for all their piety, they want to come back in the same family, which means that although they're performing rituals, their spiritual knowledge hasn't begun to be awakened. They're performing rituals, but they're materially attached. They want to come back in the same family. They feel attached to that. There's, in Sattva Gun, one of the qualities of Sattva Gun is that one becomes complacent, one becomes attached to a sense of happiness. The sense of happiness one gets from being in Sattva Gur, which is not the perfection of life, but people say, oh, this is very nice. So this entanglement in ritual, fruitive activities and rituals, that's impelled by Rajabhu. But there's some touch of Sattva Gur there, it's a, or it has to be, although the motive may be Rajasak, uh, how one can enjoy oneself life after life in this material world. But there has to be a good admixture of sattva gun. Otherwise, one can't perform all these rituals. It's, it's not so easy. Just to give an example, we, we find in our temples, our Iskon temples, that it's often difficult to find people to do pujari seva. There are not that many de devotees who are inclined to that. They may be inclined to running around here and there, preaching, making collection, doing so many things, managing. But to find someone who's selflessly dedicated to the deities and is happy to perform arati, four or five times a day, day after day after day, make offerings, dress the deities. It's, it resembles the ritualism being described here in, in as much as it's routine. Routine activities. You're just doing the same thing over and over again. And therefore, those who are not very fixed in what they're doing, they feel restless. The, the restless mind impels them that, no, I have to do something, I can't. They get bored. Doing the arati and just doing it like a, like a ritual. That, that word is there, like a ritual. They're doing it like that and thinking of so many other things, different things. So it requires some advancement. Of course, there's another way to get people to do pujari seva, and that's to pay them. But that's not likely to be on the same level of the devotees I was mentioning previously, Jnani Ras and Pankajangari Prabhu. Who, uh, throughout the movement, everyone recognizes that a highly advanced devotee, Prabhupada himself, said there. That was you know, 30 years ago. Prabhupada said they're perfect brahmacharis. Their minds are very peaceful. They have no desire other than to serve the Lord. And they're, they're, they're there, not just physically, but mentally they're there. They're, you could be just ding, 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 ding. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Hungry. Ding, 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 ding. You can be. But uh, they're there, 
they're there with the Lord. They're not seeing a lump of stone in front of them. But they must be seeing the Lord. Otherwise, how could they continue with so much obvious devotion for so many years? Always trying to do everything very nicely for the Lord. So, to perform ritualistic activities, it requires some, even though it's on a, in, in many ways it may appear similar to the devotees' deity worship, or the other aspects of their sadhana, but the motivation is quite different. Of course, devotees can worship the deity for fruitive results also. And, we're sorry to say, but everyone can see that we find many devotees who are worshipping the deities in India, they end up worshipping the deities in America. <laughs> and then when they get their green card, they go from deity worship India to deity worship to America to no deity worship America. So, the Lord is very kind in fulfilling their desires. <laughs> but, that's not what Prabhupada started this movement for. He didn't start the, when he said the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, the international part wasn't meant for manpower export business. It was actually meant that the, he employed that, what is it, andha the logic of the blind man and the lame man, that the Western countries are blind and India is like a lame man, so together one can carry the other, one, one has got the physical energy and the other has got the vision. So combined, neither can, neither can go anywhere very satisfactorily. But if they combine, the blind man can carry the layman who gives directions. Now India is also more or less blind. They're blinded by the technology of the lame West. Sorry, the blind West. Now they've become technologically somewhat somewhat adept, uh, but in the course of doing so they become more and more blind. So, anyway, the Krishna Conscious Moon is meant for giving this spiritual knowledge which transcends international boundaries, like India and America. Although what's being described here is, the, in this verse, is the, the culture of ancient India, which is meant for going back home, back to Godhead, not to the higher planetary systems. But that piety is there, and that requires, to execute these pious activities, self-control is required, faith in Shastra is required, so, performing fruitive activities is, in this chapter, it is condemned, but at the same time, it's condemned, but at the same time, it's part of the Vedic process. So, it's not wholly condemned. From one perspective, it's condemned, because it's a waste of, it's a waste of time, it's a waste of human energy. Having obtained this rare human form of life, one should utilize it for acquiring that which is substantial, that which is meaningful. One who is dhira, one who is cool-headed, sense-controlled, he can perceive what is the actual purpose 
of human life and dedicate his life to achieving that, understanding that I have to die soon, no one will live long. But before this body is finished, we should engage in activities for, a quiet, for attaining to the ultimate goal of life, which is Krishna consciousness. And not engaging in sense gratificatory activities, which are available in every form of life. So an intelligent person should see this. It's not intelligent to perform even religious activities for the wrong reason. So one should do the right thing and for the right reason. Even to do the right thing for the wrong reason gives a different result. Just like the, the idea that we shall, we shall join ISKCON and worship the deities and then go overseas and solve our economic problems. Now, all right, that's better, maybe better than, or well, certainly is better than being a complete non-devotee. We're not saying that people who do this are not devotees. But that's mixed devotion. One has some definite material gain that is sought after. So that is not as good as serving the Lord simply for His pleasure. So even in the ritualistic activities which are being described here, it's not that there's no Krishna consciousness, there is some recognition of Vishnu in yagyas, Vedic society is based around performance of yagya. So yagya pati is Vishnu. Everything is to be offered to Vishnu. Even if the yagya is performed for, it, it may be performed for Indra or for the Pitris or whatever, but always the mantra is there that Yagyapati is Vishnu. So some consciousness is there. In Vedic culture, it's so designed that one cannot but be conscious of Vishnu. But if one is conscious of him, but only in a secondary way, or if one has some other agenda, then one will not get the same result as those who perform everything. What is that verse? Loka ki vaidiki va piyakriya kurte mune hari sevanu kulaiva sakayam bhakti chata. That all activities, both those prescribed in the Vedas and others which are just you know, regular day to day activities. Uh, they should be performed only in a manner that is favorable for cultivating Krishna consciousness. This is the uh, how to practice bhakti in this world. So what is the attitude? The, we could say the Rupa Goswami Prabhupada has given the summation of the Bhagavatam in his own composed verse that Anyabhilashita Shunyam Jnana Kama Dhyana Bitam Anukulyena Krishna Nishilanam Bhakti Bhitam that Anukul word comes again. Anukul in mean favorable in relationship to Krishna. Hari Seva Anukul Daiva that I was just quoting. Rupa Goswami quotes that from Narada Pancharatra. So everything should be favorable for the service for, for, of Krishna, for cultivating Krishna consciousness, and specifically free from the intent, the motive to, uh, or the idea that one can advance oneself in any other way, either through the karma kanda or the jnana kanda. So that's the intent with which bhakti should be performed. And how is it practically performed? That Rupa Goswami next gives Sarvopadi Vinir Muktam Tatparatvena Nirmalam Rishikena Rishikesha Sevanam Bhakti Ruchita. 
So this is another definition of bhakti he gives. Again from Narada Pancharantra, which states that practically, one lives in this world, one has to live in this world, sarvopadhivinir muktam, without identifying oneself with it. Without identifying, everyone, just by being born, one acquires upadhis, or designations. Just by being, immediately you become the son of your parents. Or you become the brother of previously born children of the same parents. Then you acquire automatically a caste, and in the modern age, a country, although there was no countries in previous ages. There were different kingdoms, and the borders might change, but the idea of Bharat, Mera Bharat Mahan, this idea has come. But they, there was no political unit known as Bharat until the British came and unified it all. So Bharat is a British invention, like everything else in Bharat, except Jalebis, practically. <laughs> or down here, it's Dosa and Italy. The British didn't invent that. But cricket, just for your information, is a game which came from England. It's got nothing to do with India. But now they have accepted it. More important than religion. <laughs> that we know because if we go to a program and there's no one there, we know India's playing Pakistan. <laughs> and everyone's watching it on the TV. So, we can see if devotees are advancing in Krishna conscious or not, if they're not listening on the radio to the cricket game, as we've seen in many places. The brahmacharis are listening to the, what's going on. So one should be free of the designation, I am Indian, I am American. Sarvopadi vinir muktam tat parat nir malam. One should identify with that which is para, that which is beyond this material world, that which is free of any contamination. Then practically, hishikena hishikesha sevanam bhakti uchchate. Engaging one's senses in the service of the master of the senses. Practical. Not that just one is anyabhilashita shunya, free of all other desires, but practical, the desire must be how to serve Krishna, how to engage one's body, mind, and senses. Here the senses are stressed. Rishikena, Rishikesha, Sevana, the senses are to be engaged in the service of the master of the senses. So, bhakti, it may seem like rituals that one is required to rise early in the morning, attend various services. There's a fixed schedule. Now, on the platform of ragatmika bhakti, or that of the pure devotees who are directly engaged in Krishna's Leela. There is also a schedule. Krishna has his Ashtakaliya Leela. There are different activities at different times of the day. But there is a great measure of spontaneity in how they act, how the devotees act, in response to ever unpredictable Krishna. You don't know what he's going to do next. And devotees are also impelled by Krishna's Leela Shakti. You can never tell what they're going to do either. So everything is quite spontaneous. And that gives rise to lots of fun. Still there's a framework. So sometimes devotees or neophyte devotees, they think that, well, following this program, 
following these rules and regulations, that's not bhakti, because bhakti is spontaneous. So why all these rules? One of my disciples is trying to convince me that I should be more flexible as a guru and not insist on all these rules and regulations so that she can have a real free person-to-person -person exchange and I can you know, just instruct her according to her personal need. One of her personal needs is not to chant 16 rounds a day. See, so I have to be more flexible with her. But I told her that I, my only function as a guru is to impart to you what is given by Srila Prabhupada. Even if I, even if I thought it was a good idea, I have no right to. I, I, actually, I don't even have the right to think it's a good idea. I don't have the right to. What she's saying to me, the GBC should consider there are so many people that can't chant 16 rounds, they should make the initiation standard different. But the, the GBC also doesn't have any right to do so. The GBC has the right to uphold Srila Prabhupada's instructions and the duty to do so, not to alter them. So, what is spontaneous devotional service is often misunderstood. Even if you talk about the Ragatmika platform, that means the platform of the eternally liberated Vrajvasi, Nanda Maharaj, Yashoda, the gopis, all. But Raganuga Bhaktas, those who are following in the mood of a Raga Nuga, a devotee on the platform of Raga Nuga Bhakti follows the example of a particular Ragatmika Bhakti, internal. And externally he goes on with Vaidhi Sadhana, Sadhana according to the prescribed rules and regulations, which is not it's not that these rules and regulations... Someone was asking this, uh, well, by following the rules and regulations, don't, doesn't the heart become hard? Uh, uh, what did they ever understand? These rules and regulations are for bringing us in contact with Krishna, which if we follow makes the heart soft. How is it that by the rules and regulations are hearing about Krishna, chanting about Krishna, and how does that make the heart hard? It should make the heart soft. Uh, uh, Softness of heart is a symptom of love of God. Of course, if we simply stress the rules and regulations without understanding the purpose of them, that's already stated by Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada. That is, niyama agraha, agraha, enthusiasm for the niyam. But in the name of avoiding niyama agraha, enthusiasm for the niyam, we can go to the other side, another kind of niyama agraha, which is niyama agraha, not accepting the niyam. But I, I'll just be spontaneous. I'll spot this morning I'm going to spontaneously sleep up to six o'clock because I don't believe in following all the reg rules and regulations. But I can tell you that I was dreaming of Krishna. <laughs> So, <laughs> don't say anything to me. I'm, you don't have to get me up, I'm already Krishna conscious. <laughs> but those who are already Krishna conscious, they're more enthusiastic to, to follow all the activity. What are these rules that are given to us? They are rules to do what we should do if we were actually spontaneous in love of Krishna. So they, they only, the advanced or spontaneous devotee doesn't follow the rules, he just hears and chants about and serves Krishna. He doesn't follow the rules means the, the rule, he automatically that's included. It's automatically there. For him it's not a rule. You don't have to tell a pure devotee, you have to chant Hare Krishna. <sighs> okay. Hare <laughs> Krishna. It's not a burden for him. It's automatically. It's, it's the Nama Ruchi, it's the taste for the holy names. And you can see Prabhupada, he enjoyed chanting the holy names of Krishna. It wasn't a 
as he as Prabhupada one time he himself mimicked or joked that he was chanting Hare Krishna, then he put his beads on and said, now I finished 16 rounds, I can do any damn thing I like. <laughs> so that's the, the feeling of a person who thinks that you have to chant 16 rounds, and now I finished 16 rounds, and now I won't chant any more round than nothing in the rest of the day. Now I finished. Often we hear it was, I finished my rounds. <laughs> really? Finished. Finished. <laughs> <laughs> you could say that I completed my minimum quota, but not that ah, whew, finished. <laughs> this is a ritualistic approach. At the time of initiation, it's asked that what are the minimum number of rounds you will chant then? Is if you say, I'll chant 16 rounds, and then someone suggests you chant more rounds, say, no, no, I have vowed to chant 16 rounds. <laughs> Minimum, not 16, not, not one. And round also means, not that you just go round, but you, on each bead, the Hare Krishna Baha Mantra is chanting. <laughs> so, there's one devotee, he used to finish his rounds, in about 45 minutes. <laughs> I'm saying, well, say to him, well, how, how can you finish six years? So I've been round 16 times. I'm sitting here and I went round. Yeah, but maybe it's three or four beads per mantra. It's, it's getting very, it's very enthusiastic for finishing his rounds. <laughs> But what is the purpose that on each bead the Maha Mantra has to be chanted? So he kind of missed the point there. And he's saying, yeah, well, you can chant around in three and a half minutes. What's the problem? So, speed chanting. That means taking as a ritual. We actually have to consider this. The rules and regulations, they're not given as a ritual, nor should we take them as rituals to be performed. It's not, bhakti is not a mechanical process. That if, of course, Prabhupada said 16 plus 4 equals BTG. 16, right? If you follow four regulated principles, chant 16 rounds, you'll go BTG, back to God. <laughs> but there has to be some awakening of feeling also. You know, just now we're talking about Raga, Noga, Bhakti, and the devotees are enthusiastic to discuss Raga, Noga, Bhakti, and the dealings of Radha and Krishna and all these things. But what is the adhika, what is the eligibility to enter all these things. It's just by talking about, if you, is it just by saying Jai Radhe, one becomes transformed into a gopi? But one actually has to get taste for the holy names. One has to cry out, as Bhakti Thakur has taught us in so many songs. Kabe Habe Balo Shede Nama, Bhaguchi, Shudhaname Ruchi, Kribabale Habe Hridoye Shancha. We will get taste for the holy names and we give up offenses. And by the mercy of Nam Prabhu, that the, the taste for the name will be infused into our hearts. So that is required. Then again, how will we get taste for the holy name? We'll, what shall we do? We'll run away and sit on a hill somewhere and just chant and chant. But that also we have to serve the holy name. What is that? Shataya, Shunvatam Shataya Nityam. No, not that verse. Susu Shu Shadama Nasya. Vasudeva Kataru Chihi. What's the rest of the verse? Syang Maha. Sevya Vipra Punya Tirta Nishivanat. One can get a taste for hearing Krishna Kata if one serves those who are 
engaged in broadcasting. So service is required. Hearing is required. Chanting is required. Everything is required. It's a complete program. So the rules and regulations are there. They're all focused on hearing and chanting about Krishna. And the life, what, what makes it come alive? What's the difference between someone who's serving very nicely with some material motive and gets their material desire fulfilled? They go to useless America. I mean, they could at least desire to go to the Pitri Loka. Here it's described, uh, they could put their eyesights a little higher. There's one devotee, he's been, he was actually initiated in the Gorya Mart years, years ago. He's been in Iskon temples. I first saw him in, in Delhi in 1977, August 1977. So he's already been serving in Iskon for years at that time. And he's still, I think he's in Puri now. He's been serving in Iskon temples for years and he does all kinds of menial services, although he's quite an educated person. But he says openly, I want to go to the heavenly planets and this is the best way to do it. If we serve the devotees, we'll go to the heavenly planets. So he's quite clear about what his goal is. <laughs> of course, if he's, now he's old, if he dies in Puri, then his desire may not be fulfilled. He may go to Jagannath. <laughs> Because Jagannath is also in the heavenly planets. So. Anyway, one may perform devotional services with one material motive. What is the? What is it? What is the? What is the life of bhakti? What? What is it that that our attempts in devotional service carry us beyond? the heavenly planets, back to the spiritual world. Well, we can say Guru Kripa, but then our ability to accept Guru Kripa depends also upon our motivation. So motivation, Sharana Agati, Bhakti no Thakur says. Shikai Sharana Agati Bhakate Pran. The Sharana Agati, the motive of surrender to Krishna, that is the life of the devotees. That, that's what makes bhakti bhakti. That's what makes the, that's the difference between the deity worship of the materialistic person and the deity worship of someone whose only motive is to go to Krishna because they are cultivating that anukul yasya sankalpa. They've made the determination that everything they should do, everything they do should be for the sake of satisfying Krishna. So they see what will satisfy Krishna, how to satisfy Krishna in everything they do. Loki ki, vaidhi ki, vapi, ya kriye, ya kriya kriya te muni. Hari, seva anukul, everything should be anukul, everything should be favorable for the service of Hari. So this is far, far higher platform than these ritualistic perf uh, performers of ritualistic activities which are being described here. They're just on a very, uh, actually very mundane platform. They're still to be awakened to Gyan. All this performance of karma is to awaken one to Gyan that this material world is miserable, therefore let me get liberated from it. And then beyond that, Bahunam Jambanam Ante Gyanavan Maam Prabhadyate. Then after many lives as a jnani, one can come to the understanding that Vasudev, Krishna, is all in all. By Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mercy, that awareness which may be aroused after many, many lifetimes of performance of pious activities, then renunciation of pious activities and cultivation of jnana, and then finally understanding Krishna is all in all. And surrendering to him, one can take to that immediately. Which is what is implied here by describing this entanglement in fruit activities. It is to impel the devotee not to 
become entangled. Don't become entangled. Become sarva padi vidir muktam, free from all mundane designations. Then one, when one is serving the Lord, then automatically one who has this attitude, then he's automatically eligible for serving the Lord. If one is to serve the deity, first one has to perform bhuta shuddhi. All the, his, his body has to be purified. But one who's, who from the beginning understands, naham vipro na chanara pati na vaishana shudro. I don't belong to any category of this material world. I simply identify myself as Gopi Bharatur, Pada Kamalayor, Das Udasa, Dasa. Such a person is always pure. So we hear Bhagavatam regularly to uh, understand this point and reinforce this consciousness that we do not belong to this material world, we belong to Krishna. Everyone works for some purpose. No one does anything without a purpose. Or even if someone does nothing, they do that for a purpose also. Why are you doing nothing? Because uh, one may do nothing because he's frustrated with everything he's trying. <laughs> or one may do nothing, just I just want to relax. So even doing nothing is one kind of doing something. It's just like sometimes we see outside, the, someone puts outside the door, outside their door, if you've got nothing to do, please go and do it somewhere else. Don't disturb me. You've got nothing to do, you just want to waste my time. So go somewhere else and do it. So, everything we do is with a purpose. So that purpose should be, we should understand what is the highest purpose. Nati vidu swartha gating hi vishnu. Because we don't understand what is our swart, our real self-interest, which is to serve Vishnu. Therefore, we go on inventing. Durasha ye bahiratamaninaha. We go on inventing all different kinds of ideas. What will be my self-interest? With all of these, any desire except that to surrender to Krishna works against our real self-interest. So even the apparently highly elevated and pure life of ritualistic activities is being condemned here. That it's certainly better than the life of wanton hedonism, but is not the goal of life. It's materialistic and it entangles us in fruitive activities. But then again, there is, as I was saying at the beginning of this lecture, we, we can't even find anyone who's that pious now to, even if they, to follow all these things. Therefore, it's recommended just chant Hare Krishna. Just chant, of course, there's so many other rules and regulations to follow. They all support this chanting, but the, the basis of all spiritual activities in the present ages. Haren nama, haren nama, haren nama, eva kevalam. Kalo nasteva, 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 kitiranyata. Even if one wants to go to the heavenly planets, that uh, by performing the ritualistic activities, it's not likely that we'll go because everything is so corrupt polluted in the modern age. Just, you want to do some some special puja, then you have to use water from the tap, which is recycled stool water. So it's not pure. Or in the apartment next to you, and just on the other side of the wall, there's someone cooking meat. So how can you be pure? Or even one thing we is that we meet so many pious people, but they're, they're their attitude is pious, but they're so misdirected that for all their apparent piety, they're definitely going to hell. Just like, <laughs> just like we find many people who are pious, but they worship some bogus incarnation of God. And they're very religious, and they get up every morning, and they sing some Sai Bhajans or something like this. They're very pious, and they have a lot of faith, but the result is that they go to hell, because they're 
Their, their piety is misdirected because they identify someone who's very clearly not God as God. And so although they, they have the feeling of being very religious and being good, but they end up in hell because they made the gross mistake of accepting someone who's not Bhagavan as Bhagavan. And so it all comes to the same point. We should teach the chanting of Hare Krishna and distribute these books. Now the marathon is coming up. It's a good opportunity to distribute many of Srila Prabhupada's books. Live according to the direction of Bhagavatam, as Prabhupada told us. We should make Bhagavatam our life. So that means distributing it, reading it, living by it. Do everything for the satisfaction of Krishna. Hare Krishna. Is there any question, please, or comment? No. So, where do you all want to go? Pitri Loka? Sai Loka? Krishna Loka? To the Prasad room? Wherever you go, take your bead bag with you. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada.